morning, everyone, and welcome back to the CBI at 10. Um, we have a good deal to talk about this morning. Actually, Tony, as we were kicking off this morning, I was thinking, what a wonderful thing it is to be talking about the weather. For the first time in a few weeks, we've been talking about something else. And so I wanted to welcome everyone by saying good morning. I hope you're keeping well and also keeping warm uh, in these cold days. But we're going to talk mainly this morning about uh, tech innovation and the way in which it's going to be essential both to living through these lockdowns and economy with COVID, but the but the program of uh, building an economy uh, beyond the pandemic. Um, a, a big thank you uh, to Rebecca Falder and to Lindsay Phillips uh, for joining us. And Rebecca and Lindsay, I'm going to come to you in a minute. But, but Tony Danker, Director General of the CBI, Tony, can we, can we start with just what your read is on what the roadmap is from here, given what we were hearing about variants, Progreen on progress on vaccine deployment. What's your understanding that businesses should begin to expect now? Yeah, well, we, uh, as you know, James, and good morning, everybody, uh, we've said that what we think we need now is a very practical, pragmatic, workplace-oriented roadmap. Obviously, the big decisions about when we reopen and tiering and so on, those get taken by the Prime Minister uh, with SAGE and so on. But what businesses are lacking at the moment is a real practical roadmap of trying to understand the sequence of things as the economy opens up. And so we've, uh, in the last week, we just finished on Friday a consultation uh, with members and we got lots and lots of responses. And just to summarize, I mean, we are just working our way through them. Uh, three things just really very important for everybody. The first one is this idea of a roadmap and a sequence. Uh, what do we need to have when? So when do I need to think about workplace testing? How does that relate to tiers? What's its relationship to vaccination, et cetera, et cetera. So I think people really want to have some visibility of the sequencing of things that they need to think about for their business over the course of the year. Uh, secondly, uh, a lot of sectors would like a two week warning. Now, not everybody, some people are happy to just overnight get ready as soon as possible. But a lot of people were saying to us, look, can we just have a two week heads up to prep? That means we can reopen properly and be prepared in terms of staff and training and customer readiness. And the third one, everybody is talking about is schools. Schools is the first step. I think no matter what sector you're in, uh, the biggest dampener on, on, on business viability at the moment is getting kids back to school. I mean, it's good for educational and social reasons, but it's also the most critical uh, economic uh, piece of the roadmap. So I have meetings today, uh, both with Quasi and with the permanent secretary at base, and we're really trying to push them hard to get ahead of these kinds of issues. We're not saying, you know, you have to reopen the economy now. We are saying, look, there is a list of, you know, 50 to 60 issues that businesses are raising. And if we can get some clarity on them, when we reopen the economy, we'll do so with confidence, with certainty and with COVID-19 COVID safety compliance. So that's what we're focused on in our discussions with Bayes at the moment. It's such, a, it's such a curious thing, isn't it, Tony? Because on the one hand, you can't but be impressed by the rate of this vaccine rollout. And on the other hand, there are these big gaps in what people are beginning to expect, either around the variants and real understanding of what the vaccine's efficacy is against the variant, but also even around this March 8th date in terms of return to schools, because by then it's doesn't seem plausible that all teachers, let alone all parents, are going to be vaccinated. And so is the, is the, what's the best way for businesses that are trying to plan to feed in to the conversations you're having with Bayes, with, with the business secretary? What's the most important thing that businesses can do on calls like this in the exchange with the CBI? Well, look, I think, uh, and Alice will put in the chat, uh, the coronavirus mailbox, please keep giving us uh, feedback on what the issues are that are front of mind for you, the unanswered questions for you. Look, if it comes down to when is the economy going to reopen or who gets the vaccine next, obviously we can answer those questions. But if it comes mm -hmm. down to what we're really interested in is what will clarify your scenario planning, what will help you in your preparedness. And by the way, you know, James, you talk about vaccines and variants. Of course, Britain is pretty much at the forefront of this. 
I'm always, uh, I'm always reminded when I speak to some of my uh, opposite numbers in different countries, they are looking to us to make the law, to make the precedence on this stuff. So I think we should be conscious that we are right at the frontier. And I suspect this dialogue between us and, and you who are watching about what are the issues we need to tackle next, it'll be going on throughout the year. So again, yeah. Alice will put in the email address and just give us the feedback particularly around the things that you feel you can't plan for and you'd love to be able to plan for. Uh, that's what we're most interested in. All right. Uh, I, in that vein, Tony, a similar issue, the budget. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unpredictable in its own ways. But the, the people have seen over the weekend that there was some reporting, Tony, about the extent to which the Treasury was asking the CBI, I think this was as relates to a uh, online sales tax, but it seems to me to play more broadly to the question of the Treasury is really obviously in kind of deep budget planning mode. I'm just interested to know how does business weigh in? What's the CBI's role between here and March the 3rd? Sure. Well, look, uh, first of all, on the weekend story, the Treasury has been doing a business rates review, uh, which we pushed hard for for a long time. Uh, and they're doing a business rates review, uh, which they kicked off at the last budget. And yes, we've been helping, supporting them, bringing members to them on that. And it's about business rates as a whole. And absolutely, as you say, they'll also be looking at things like uh, online sales tax. But I, I think the budget is a much bigger story, as you say. And I think there's two questions to it, really. One is, is this just going to be a short-term budget and will the Chancellor have to return to the longer-term economic questions later in the year? That's probably where we are, I think, as an economy, but he might want to try and do uh, more stuff sooner. But secondly, the real exam question, I think, for the budget and for the Chancellor is how are we going to get growth back in the economy? If you don't get the economy growing, then you're left with a series of you know, unpalatable choices. And as you know, in our CBI forecast for growth in the next two years, most of the lifting is being done either by household spending, which we hope will bounce back as the economy reopens, or government spending. And so if the Chancellor is worried about the medium term fiscal position, which of course he should be, then we need to try and boost that third leg of the stool, which is about business growth, business economic growth, business receipts. Uh, and that really, for us, is what the budget needs to be about. It needs to be about, can we bolster business investment, get the economy motoring so that we've got a growth engine to sort of match that government spending and household spending? And so I, I hope and I believe that the Chancellor will want to think about that above all, whether it's at this budget or a statement later in the year. Okay, well, I, I imagine we're going to talk a fair bit about this. And actually, we might talk um, towards the end, Tony, if we can, just about your speech last week and about how the sort of vision for the growth of the economy fits into that. Um, it, it, it naturally fits on the back of the conversation, which is the, the core of our focus this morning, about how technological innovation can actually transform business investment, you know, and address some of the productivity problems in the UK. Before I come to Rebecca, do you have a, a a view on this, Tony, of what's happening in the UK in terms of technology adoption and investment? Yeah, look, this is a subject I care a great deal about and I've done loads of work on, so I can't wait to hear Lindsay and Rebecca talk about it. Just a couple of things that are worth noting. You know, uh, before the crisis, and uh, I can't imagine it's changed radically, you know, we were ninth in the world in terms of overall competitiveness. We were 31st in the world in terms of technology adoption. The British story has been a story of two halves, well, not even two halves, but it's been a story of two speeds, really. Uh, we have some very, very digital businesses, and we have a lot of businesses who are adopting leading edge technology, but we have the bulk of the economy, and there are probably a lot of Lindsay's clients, and Lindsay will be onboarding them with Sage technology, who are really behind on business technology adoption, and therefore missing out on a huge productivity prize. Now, of course, the crisis comes along, and you see you know, a decade's worth of progress in literally a year. And by the way, you don't only just see it in terms of e-commerce. It's very clear that if you're a B2C business, the first thing you did last March was strengthen your online channel. And it'd be interesting to hear Rebecca talk about, you know, the growth of the online channel uh, as a way to re reach customers. But also the businesses that I spoke to, in particular SME businesses, they realized that technology was actually about your resilience as a business. You know, why is the sales Rolodex still on cards in the office? Why do I not have access to my HR systems and my records? I should be able to do this from home. And so you had a real adoption of what I call productivity technology, business operations technology as well. And I think we now need to find a way 
to lock in that new find advantage, to lock in that tech confidence that I think exists amongst business people, which by the way is one of the reasons why one of the, our budget asks uh, is to have productivity vouchers, technology adoption vouchers for SMEs to really lock in you know, the gains that they've made in confidence and experimentation in the last year and convert that finally to a productivity prize of UK business getting way higher than 31st in the world for technology adoption to being really at the forefront in international competitiveness lead tables when it comes to the use of tech. Sorry, and Tony, for people who are not in the weeds of CBI budget suggestions, a technology adoption voucher for how much and yeah. who gets it? Well, we're talking to the Treasury about that, but I think the idea should be focused on SME businesses, SME and potentially micro businesses. Uh, and it's basically to give them a, a, a access to classic uh, software, business software that enhances your productivity. So uh, one of the things we'll be doing with the Treasury is identifying how you bound those technologies. But look, we all know it'll be things like online accounting systems, online HR systems, CRM systems, ERP systems. You know, most of the classic, we're not talking about highly bespoke software. We're talking about off the shelf technology systems that have a proven impact on productivity that an amazing number of businesses aren't using today. And we think they should be. All, all right, Tony, thank you. Um, Re Rebecca, Lindsay, thank you for waiting so patiently. Um, I'm, Re Rebecca, I'm gonna come to, to you first um, because uh, actually the thing that's really exciting about getting the chance to talk to you, uh, I should have said, you know, I think you're the quality systems manager at HMT Paints. Well, the most exciting thing for me is to get some advice on what color we paint these walls, to be honest, because this is my, <laughs> obviously I've carved out at home. But, but I think a lot of people are really aware that big businesses have their own CTO, their own technology functions. So the, the transformation of small businesses is, I think, as Tony says, very two speed, isn't it? Some people have really embraced it. Some people are just not changing at all. I just wonder whether you could just start by telling us the story if from HMG Paints, where it's really hit, where you've really seen technology actually transform the performance of the business. Yeah, of course. And firstly, thank you for having me on the webinar today. And a lot of what Tony said so far has really struck a chord. And for us, we were definitely on the slower side of the technology adoption speed rather than the pioneering. Although we have had some areas where we've been a little bit more pioneering. I think the general view of and sort of position of HMG has been more of a traditional manufacturing, quite paper-based systems. Um, so obviously the pandemic has really sort of kicked us and given us a big push in terms of that. And as to your question of where we've seen the biggest um, impact, we have focused on a few key problems within the business that needed improvement. So one of our main areas that needed improvement was we have separate internal systems with quite a lot of data silos and weaknesses in the way the data is shared between them. So for us, implementing kind of off the shelf systems wasn't very easy because of the complex links that we had between our existing systems. One of the main things we tried to do initially was sort that out and have a bit of a data reorganization, which was quite difficult, but we've managed to get some, some along the way anyway. We're not there all the way yet. Um, we have, overhauled our dispatch department is one of the main projects we've done and initially we started by looking at off-the-shelf um, warehouse management systems but we had a kind of planned implementation of 2022 2023 just because of the sheer level of investment that would have been for us and although the systems were fantastic and dazzling and you know would have been really really you know exciting and great I think we realized that actually the solutions were already in-house for us and we could adapt our current systems just slightly to make it so we can do things completely differently and I think that was a, a big lesson for us is you know the most exciting option isn't necessarily the best one particularly as a smaller business I yeah. think you can you can tend to over complicate things when it comes to dig digitalization mm -hmm. um, particularly because there's so many exciting technologies out there uh, and Rebecca, just tell us, within HMG Paints, are you talking about technologies that have transformed the internal workings of the business, i.e. accounts, 
you know, management of inventory, etc., or is it transform the relationship with customers and the data and service of those individuals? Well, so a little bit of both, really. So pre-pandemic, we implemented a CRM system which brought together quite a lot of our previous systems and kind of eliminated the need for the older ones and brought in the new version, which helped transform it from a customer's perspective. Although it was more of an internal system, our data but for our customers and the way we could interact with our customers was, you know, the product productivity was transformed. Um, and then kind of leading up to and in the pandemic, we focused more on internal issues and really solving the key day-to-day -day issues of, and productivity gap and skills gap that we've seen. Mm. And, 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 and I'm going to come to Lindsay in one moment, but, but Rebecca, when you said you didn't go and sort of, you know, buy the bespoke heavy capital investment tech system, one of the questions I've got is within the business, who is the sort of tech lead? Are you the tech lead for the business or have you had to sort of contract someone in to do that? No, so it's definitely definitely not me, although I've been involved in um, a lot of the projects. Um, we're quite lucky in that we've got a few people that are quite techy already. Um, so we, we have an in-house IT team, three people for for an SME. I think that's quite a, a lot. Um, um, and they've obviously you, been- Rebecca, just to give you a sense, how, how many people are there all together in the company? Um, sorry, uh, about 180. So, oh, okay. so we've got quite a large IT team full-time team um, but also the for example our dispatch manager and our um, production director and quite a few key people have got very strong skills in technology and and also just very good at assessing what's best and the options and I think one of the things we found quite early on was trying to do it as a decision by committee with everybody involved wasn't going to be the right way so we the board had to kind of put their trust in key members of staff and you know interject at key points but really not get involved with the day-to-day -day, you know which system we're going to adapt and in the very nitty-gritty details the board didn't need to be involved in because it would have just ended up taking forever to get it implemented <laughs> I can, I can, well, but, but I'm really interested in that because I think a lot of companies make this, have this difficult choice, which is, do we do this in-house? Do we get someone outside? Does the outsider really mm -hmm. understand that the insiders have the tech skills? So it's, it's I'd like to yeah. come back to a little bit more about process, but I'm going to bring Lindsay in for, first. L Lindsay, th thank you so much for joining us. I always think the amazing thing about uh, Sage, the company you work for, is it's sort of like the kind of, spine or at least the nervous system of our so much of our you know monthly pay packets or weekly pay packets and the, the marketplace we're in and yet when we looked at the extent to which banking and the payment systems in our own country have just transformed in a year it's amazing how far we've got to go so so would you give us a sense of how the pandemic has changed things at sage just this year before we get into the lessons we can learn for others yeah, absolutely. So I think it's, it's really interesting. A lot of what Tony and, and in fact Rebecca was saying around investment um, and the, the, the value of technology to business um, during the course of the pandemic is, is huge. Right? And I mean, we, we did some research halfway through last year, um, and by that time, about 73% of, of SMEs said they'd adopted some form of new technology. Um, so, so it's really, really clear that you know technology is so important at the moment to businesses. And I think. Now, what what we're seeing in particular is that particularly with with lockdowns and, and needing to work from home re remote access being able to work anywhere and, and connect back to the office systems is, is is really fundamental and we're seeing a significant uptake in the use of our cloud products um, because that enables that kind of very organically out of the box um, I, I think what we, we, we've seen a number of effects that there's, there's been some in, internal effects for us as, as we sent everybody home what we had to take a different approach to being a, a digital provider of, of software so that meant re rethinking a little bit how we delivered support services to customers um, so we've delivered much more webinars just like this one um, and had massive massive update the, the other thing that we've I think spent a lot of focus on is how do we support our customers at this time not just in terms of 
the situation they are in in terms of you know, the, the financial pressure it, it's put on all businesses, but also trying to help better understand the, the compliance and legislation that's come out from government. Um, we spent a huge amount of effort last year working on um, the, the, the job retention scheme and providing extra tooling uh, to customers to enable them to calculate fellow payments and get that right um, so that when they did submit them, uh, they had the security of knowing what they'd submitted to government was was, was the right figures because the, the furlough scheme is pretty complex. Um, I think we worked out there were something like 6,000 different combinations that you, you could calculate. So it's, it's a complicated thing. But the other thing that I think we've seen a lot of is um, we focus, to, to me, 2010 is very much the year of payroll um, and the, the extension of payroll services into employee self-service type type solutions. Now, at its probably most basic, it's you know, how do you get your payslip online? Um, but, but actually, it, it's become a lot more than that in terms of uh, the, the interaction between the employer and the employee on a digital basis, because you're not in the office necessarily anymore, but you're still working and you're still trying to make things happen. Um, so, so a lot of our investment has been in that area around extending the HR system on a digital basis uh, for, for our customers so that they can take advantage of you know, the, the employee experience in the cloud as opposed to on, on paper or, or, or charts on the wall. Um, so, so that digitization, I think, has been a really fundamental fundamental thing for us. And, and Lindsay, could, can you, for, for people listening in, they'll hear what you're saying and they'll hear, and it's worth exploring some of those points about flexibility within uh, within a business, responding to innovations in, you know, in tax or government support. But at the heart of the question is the extent to which technology can improve productivity. And I suppose people will hear what you say about payroll services and say, okay, well, that will improve our efficiency. Will it necessarily improve our productivity? How will it actually improve business performance? So I think the productivity is interesting because I think if you can be more efficient as a business, you can then start focusing on things that are important to you and, and spend less time on uh, activities that are important but don't add natural value add to, to your business itself. Um, so if, if we take an example in, in the banking space, um, open banking uh, has, has become more and more of a thing um, in, in, in the UK and across Europe um, and the various initiatives have helped open up banking data. Now, one of the things that you can do in our products is using the, the open, open banking um, framework, you're, you're able to download your bank transactions to your accounting yeah. software. And in your accounting okay. software, you can build out rules which will automatically match your bank transactions with uh, the entries in, in the accounting product. And you know, for, 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 for even for a relatively small business, that can be an awful lot of transactions every month. So the more you can automate those kind of things and leverage the data that's available to you, um, the, the more time you get back to focus on what's important in the business. So I think mm -hmm. you know, the, the real value of using technology, whether it's accounting software, payroll software, HR systems, is that, that the processes that you have to follow, that, that you need to follow as a business, uh, the ability to automate those becomes much greater. And it means that you can mm -hmm. free up time in your business to do other things that add real value, mm -hmm. and real productivity value to the business, as opposed to having to, to, to focus on, on, on the routine stuff. And, and we see that yeah. also with accountants, right? So um, automation for accountants is really important because it means that instead of doing the, the high volume transactional stuff with their clients, um, they can absolutely do the more value added advisory type stuff, which will help businesses grow and be more productive. So I think going back to your question, it's, it's very much about if, if you if you get the the, the the effectiveness right, you can focus much more on business. Yeah. And Bruno, I was just going to say, presumably from a macro point of view, if the whole country is, if you like, reading their monthly statements and rewarding the businesses that best serve them, it's an environment that is more likely to reward innovation and, and customer service and successful, you know, new entrance into the, into the marketplace. Uh, Tony, you were going to say something? Yeah, well, we've, uh, we, we do a regular tech tracker tool and Alice will put the, the link in the chat. And uh, one of the things that came out on the tech tracker tool in December, which just speaks to Lindsay's point, is 
one of the key opportunities, but it, a lot of SME businesses in particular are finding a challenge, is the sort of hose pipe of data that you now have, now have about your business and how you can leverage that data for true productivity and business growth. And actually, we talk a lot about digital skills and tech skills and technology skills as if what we need to do is build a nation of coders. And don't get me wrong, that would be a good thing to do. But data analytics and understanding the data of your business and the clues it gives you to growth is one of the ways in which, you know, the pipe of data that having a digital business gives you can be converted into real opportunity. I don't, Rebecca's nodding. I don't know if, uh, if you've done something interesting with data. Yeah, well, I think for us, we just found that we were collecting so much data and we had so much and it kind of got to the point where we thought that more data is better which in a way it is but if you're not using it if no one's actually looking at it and understanding it and really doing something as a result of it then there's no point in having it you know so every piece of data has to have a purpose and a real function within the business otherwise it's just collecting a big load of things that no one's going to do anything with and that was a really important lesson for us particularly because we definitely got caught in the trap of recording for recording's sake and really that's not useful to us as a business and it just you know reduces productivity right thank you can, can i can i lindsay can i just come back to your one point that you made i i love this phrase i haven't heard the phrase before the year of payroll um, I, I imagine you may need to work for Sage for, for 2020 to feel that way. But 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 the but the interesting thing is that every business has had to rethink the way in which they organise payroll, partly as a result of furlough, but not not only because of furlough. And I just wondered whether or not you think that there is something that's going to come out of this that forces companies to rethink payroll, either whether it's around flexible working, working from home, payment systems that are other than monthly paychecks, you know, weekly or fortnightly, you know, that you deal with some of the, you know, equity issues in our economy by dealing them with a combination through treasury and through payroll. That's a really interesting question. I think um, if, if I break break the question into, into two parts, maybe the, the first in, in, in terms of payroll flexibility, let, let's say. So the notion of how you pay people, how, how you pay employees, how they engage with you, um, it, it is both very emotive and you can't get it wrong. Um, it, you know, the, the, the first time you pay somebody the wrong amount, particularly if it's too less, then uh, the trust relationship is, is broken. And, and therefore I think what becomes important with payroll is whatever method you choose to use, whether it's weekly, monthly, um, bi-weekly, um, it's really important you get it right. And, and you've got different options in how you deliver payroll to your employees. You can either do it yourself, which a lot of our customers do, or, or you can go through a bureau. And we support bureaus uh, doing payroll. But the, the getting it right piece is really important. And a, a lot of the, the challenge around payroll is, particularly if you're a bureau, is the backwards and forwards between your customer and, and you as a bureau to make sure that the numbers are right and correct. So if you can digitize that relationship so it, it becomes faster uh, and lower touch, then you can make payroll a, an easier function, I think, between the, the employee, the employer, and, and the bureau. Um, I, I think the second piece is p payroll is, is, is very much open for innovation in, in terms of we're already seeing that things like salary drawdown uh, where you know you might have worked part way through the month, but you need to um, draw down on your salary because you need to replace a tire on your car or something. Um, and, and being able to draw down on your payroll is something that is an, an interesting concept because you've already earned the money, but your employer pays you at the end of the month rather than mid month. Um, so we are working and, and, and looking at services that would complement our payroll offering to, to allow employers to sign up for those kind of kind of things. Um, the other thing that, that we do have, which is quite interesting, is something called Sage Employee Benefits, um, which it, it, what, is sorry, sorry, Sage, employee, say, Sage Employee Benefits, which is a, you know, if you work for a large corporate organisation, um, you, you quite naturally would normally have access to a whole range of uh, benefits providers, potentially discounts, that kind of stuff. But what we've been able to do is, is democratise that to our small business customers to allow them to take advantage of that as part of our offering. Um, so I think. You know, to, to your question, the 
how you deliver payroll, what you can deliver with payroll as complementary services that um, enable your employees to, to get real benefit from, from, from you as an employer, um, I, I think is, is very much opening up very, very quickly. And being more digital means that you can take advantage of attachment to payroll type services, which pr provide those kind of opportunities for your employees. So it becomes very much an employee driven employee facing offering as, as part of your your, your offer your employment offer almost and, and, and Lindsay, just just you said earlier on that you've done a bunch of webinars so you must be hearing quite a bit from your clients what are the adjustments that they're finding hard or urgent can you just give a flavor of what you're hearing back from them so the, the main focus of the webinar that we, we, we ran was to really help uh, our customers understand what things like the job retention scheme meant for them um, because the calculations are quite complicated and what we wanted to do through the webinars was re really help customers understand exactly what they needed to do in order to, to make their calculations correct i think in terms of what we've heard back is that the um the support the scheme has has delivered has been you know a lifeline uh, and we've seen massive uptake of the scheme, as, as, as we all know, uh, because of the volume of money the country spent on it. Um, the, the other thing I think we're seeing through as, as kind of feedback from our customers is that um, the need and desire to, to adopt technology um, to, to, to bring different solutions into the business, to, to become more digital, um, is, is growing and it's very strong. And the, the other thing that comes through that is we, we, we need products that are in the cloud. Um, because that makes access much easier and uh, we, we can we can operate from anywhere i think the the, the other thing that can, can we see as feedback is that the the relationship between the employer and the employee i think has gotten an awful lot stronger this year but because of the the, the, the the things that the pandemic has, has thrust upon us and you know working from home uh, access to technology at home. Um, we've all had our own personal struggles with it, right? Um, mm -hmm. But that support between the company and the employee, the employee, yeah. I think, has fundamentally shifted. Um, the, the really interesting thing for me, actually, is as we start moving back into office environments in a in a COVID protocol safe manner, um, you know, the way we work our expectations of, of where and how we work are possibly going to change quite substantially. And I think that's possibly a good yeah. thing because much more family time potentially and, and much more flexibility. Yeah, I, think, I mean, Lindsay, it's really uh, interesting. How many times you, did you say you've been into the office uh, this year? Before we got on the call, I think you said. Um, well, well I, we're building a new office at the moment I, and I've been to that office once to do some sign off stuff. But apart from that, that that's it. So um, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's few and far between. You no, know, no, it's really interesting because there's a, um, someone made a comment uh, in the chat, Adrian Went wrote, in, wrote, say, physically separating employees, all office workers moving to home, has clarified the information that passes around the business. This has made it easier for employees to understand how existing systems should be used and focus plans for their improvement. We, it's completely counterintuitive, but I'm sure that Adrian Went is right. Actually, we have thought more about the information and data that that passes between us. So, Rebecca, I don't know what you think about that in terms of how you shared information amongst the 120 people um, uh, in the company. Yeah, I think for us, because we're primarily manufacturing as well, there's been a big sort of separation from factory who have to be in, you know, otherwise yeah. they can't make anything, and office who are able to work from home. So we've really had to think about communication and how do we communicate evenly between the two across different channels? And because a lot of our factory staff don't have access to emails, for example, in their day-to-day -day role. So that's been a big challenge for us. And I think it really has, I think it's a totally correct point. It really has made us think about how people are using the existing systems we have and formalizing things a little bit more so people can really be clear on what they're expected and what, what they should be doing with the systems we have. But it's certainly not something that we've perfected yet, I don't think, but it's an ongoing challenge of communication. I think it's always a big, it's always a big uh, difficulty. Tony, can, can I can I just go back to a point you said about a nation of coders and a nation of data analysts? 
if, if you go back to the CVI annual conference in November, one of the interesting things was that almost every business came on. They Almost every single one had something to say about climate, something to say about mental health, something to say about infrastructure, and almost all something to say about skills. And I just wonder where you think this skills question fits in to technology adoption. Well, I think, you know, the one thing that we know about our skills system is that it's quite inflexible. Uh, and of course, the one thing that we know about technology is that it's unbelievably rapidly changing. Uh, you know, there's a new skills white paper out, uh, and I was talking to number 10 about it last week, and, and a lot of its focus is around flexibility. It's around flexibility on skills because uh, I think CBI research shows that by 2030, people in the workplace today, nine out of 10 people in the workplace today will need technical digital skills upgrades, right? I mean, that, that's pretty much all of us, right? We're going to need digital skill upgrade. So we need a skill system that's as quick as the technology change. And of course, that's pretty hard to do in formal education settings. It makes the workplace absolutely at the heart of digital skill building. And I, and I think that there is a, you know, there's a cause and effect relationship between digital adoption uh, and digital skill building, right? If you are a firm that is a high user and a high adopter of technology, then what you end up doing in order to reap the benefits and the ROI is upskill your employees to be able to use technologies. Likewise, if you're not use, if you're not adopting, you're probably not training either. And so I think the two work together, and it means that skills need to be in the workplace as well as in the classroom. I, I, and Lindsay, can I ask you what do you do about th this in a company like Sage? Because if you think about it. If you think about traditional professional services companies, over the course of your career, you would have more experience and you'd be more value to the company. In technology services businesses, there's a risk that your experience itself kind of drifts into obsolescence. You're less valuable, actually, as you get to later in your career. And how do you think about improving that skill set for people through the course of their life with the company? So, so it's, it's a really good question, actually, and it's something we've we've focused a lot on in the in the last 12 to 18 months. Pre-pandemic, we were starting to work on this in a quite a significant way. Um, we've invested heavily, really, really heavily in online skills training for for, for employees, and um, I think we have to go beyond the tr traditional CBT type training and really look at how interactive. Uh, web-based solutions can really work and, and and if you are a technologist there's some really good tools out there um, that many many technology companies use to to provide a plethora of courses tools that can either be self-directed um, or, or directed as as part of a, a, an employee's development plan but i think really important is giving and acknowledging that every employee in your business needs development time um, and making that sure that the space um, in their working patterns to, to, to accommodate that development time. So they have the opportunity to, to take advantage of some of those provisions you make. Um, so, so I think that there's, 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 there's probably two tracks here. One is that the self-directed stuff that um, everybody needs to kind of embrace and take on and, and, and have a sort of natural curiosity around learning uh, and around self-development. The, the other is that there are some things that are perhaps more cultural in an organization. Um, or, or driven through business priorities where l learnings are a, a need in order to, to kind of move the business forward. Um, so, you know, Sage's evolution is very much uh, moving towards becoming a, a SaaS company, software as a service company. Um, so, so a big part of that is, is driving a, a bit of a cultural change in the organization. Um, and, and that cultural change is, you know, it has to be organic, it, but it has to be led as well. But, but that drives the need for uh, I think as Rebecca said, you know, c communication has to be very curated, well thought through, particularly when you've got this s slightly strange working environment where you've got half your workforce in the office and half the workforce not. It, it becomes really, really important to get that balance right around the, the culture, the, the, giving people time to learn. Um, uh, for, for me, also one of the things we've 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 tried to work with is the apprenticeship levy, um, both yeah. for inbound. Uh, colleagues as, as well as existing employees we, we've had some some good success with it but it is challenging um, to use all the money and I think 
you know, that, that's an area that we, we certainly could look at more in, in terms of how we evolve that to, to drive that learning curious environment in, in, in organizations across the country. Re Rebecca, just to pick up on Lindsay's point and a, f a final thought, if you would, about cultural change as a result of technology. I'm really struck by what Lindsay says about the way in which the company learns new things about itself, behaves differently. Yeah. Some of that may be the pandemic. You might say to us, you know, actually, this the pandemic has transformed us, but tech has too. C can you just sort of lay out for you how you think that the culture of AMG Paints or the sense of itself as a business has changed as a result of technology adoption? Yeah, I think the the culture side is such a vital one and is is such a key area for so many businesses and particularly smaller, maybe family businesses. I don't know, but it's. It's been it's been a very big battle for us culturally, I think, to bring in some of the technologies because ultimately I think quite a few people just don't really have the desire to change what they're doing. And you know, the the culturally they they kind of want to stay with what's happening as as they are and don't see the benefits necessarily as much. So it's been it's been a real journey, you know, helping people understand why we're making the changes first of all and you know what benefits it'll bring to them directly and and making sure there is a direct benefit to them rather than just do this because you must sort of thing you know we, we try to make sure that everything we've brought in has benefits for everybody involved and culturally it's changed us a lot i think in terms of approach to change and people being more receptive to little changes i think the the forced sort of um chaos of the pandemic has really been a good catalyst for change for us i think we've we've leveraged it and made sure that we've not wasted the opportunity and although obviously it's brought a lot of challenges as well the the one constant i think for every single business is it has brought change and everyone's had to adapt in some way i think and culturally for us it has been a big shift in terms of things just everyone wanting to kind of stay with this status quo and what's you know this is this is how we do it this is how we've always done it sort of thing to well why not try something different and it's been easier to implement changes with the pandemic i think thank you yeah, I, I suppose yeah that's true that, that's true i i really appreciate people these days actually finding the things that have been forces for good in this because i think everyone's so weary actually reminding ourselves that it's made some, some useful changes. Um, Lindsay and Rebecca, thank, thank you so much. It's so interesting hearing it. And I, and I love the business of having conversations like this where you rethink the things that you're not looking at, whether it's payroll or, 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 or paints and tech in that context. I, I wanted though in the last couple of minutes just to come back to you, Tony, because when we spoke last week, you were flagging up, I think it was at Bloomberg, you gave the speech on sort of future economic thinking and if people didn't see a lot of the headlines were about 1945 versus 2008 how how you acknowledge what we got right and got wrong after the financial crisis but have perhaps greater ambition post pandemic so, so do you i'm interested to know what the feedback was on the speech and what you thought were the the messages that really landed with business yeah, you're, so what I said, there were a few big messages really. One is, uh, is this going to be a 1945 or a 2008 moment? That wasn't a political statement. It was a statement that 1945, there was, I mean, we weren't, I wasn't around. Uh, I won't comment for everyone. But there was a sense that in 1945, the country took a sort of long-term view uh, and it tried to find a national consensus about the long term. Whereas in 2008, we didn't do that. Uh, and one of the reasons I think we didn't do that is because the crisis was followed pretty quickly by an election. I think there's an opportunity now, particularly because we're at the beginning of a parliament, to try and take a long-term view. And I, and I think that the impacts of both Brexit, COVID, and climate change moving to an altogether new sort of metabolic rate of change means that we should have that again. So what I called for was a long-term view and a view formed by business and government together. Usually in UK industrial policy, what happens is the government sort of locks the door, comes up with a plan, unveils it, business tries to sort of help beat it into shape through consultation. And what happens is the sort of plan comes out that most firms go, I don't really know what that means. So can we have a long-term plan? Can it be shaped together? It's been very well received. It's been very well received in politics, both right and left, interestingly. Uh, and it's been very well received by members. I think there is that appetite 
to try and use the year to think about profound change in the economy. Uh, by the way, I, I don't pretend that that is easy, right? I think there are some sectors in the economy that have been really badly hit. Hit getting growth, uh, getting job growth and wage growth in the next decade is not straightforward. Solving an issue like this one is not straightforward. But what I tried to do in the speech was to lay down a marker that we should do something that bold. Britain doesn't really do this very often. We don't get together and have a sort of 10-year plan, but we really should now. And secondly, we should do it together. We should co-design this with government. Because it's one thing to have very macroeconomic statements like leveling up or increasing investment or solving skills. But if it doesn't make sense for sectors and for firms, if Lindsay doesn't know what to do with it, Rebecca doesn't know what to do with it, then it's not really an economic strategy. It's a political speech. And so that's the role I hope we at the CBI can play in supporting the Chancellor and the Prime Minister in forging that economic vision is to make it real for sectors and firms in our economy. Tony, Tony, thank you. And look, I hope that these conversations and the link that Alice uh, put in the chat, both for people to weigh in in terms of the roadmap, but also this longer term thinking is helpful to everyone. Uh, I see Alice has also put a link to the speech, so do take a chance uh, if you get a minute to read it. Um, for this morning, a big thank you uh, to Rebecca Fuller from HMG Paint and a big thank you to Lindsay Phillips uh, from Stage. Tony's have a good to speak to you. Uh, as I said, uh, keep warm, keep your spirits up, have a very good week. Thanks so much. Thank you.